My God, we thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your servant, Hope. I thank you for uh, saving him, for using him, for guiding him here to this place, to this day, uh, to open your word and share it with us. Uh, would you speak to him in a mighty way? Uh, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Hope, like Pastor said, I'm from Ghana. I'm a student of two universities, actually University of L'Aquila in Italy and Gidans University of Technology. So I'm studying nanotechnology, like Pastor said. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and for the opportunity to fellowship in your word. We ask that in this service, our eyes of understanding will be enlightened and we'll see you in the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we want to, today, have a conversation around the love of God. Just a very short conversation around the love of God. I remember my first time in Gospel Church, we met on level one, and pastor taught on how to give your all to God in serving God, how to not give God 90% that God is interested in, 100%. And that day, I just know that this is where I was supposed to be throughout my studies in Gidans. And I'm grateful to God that I've been here. Amen. So today, I want to just answer a very simple, or a very simple question. Does God love me? Does God love me? If I should take a survey in this room asking this question, or may probably... We go to the front of this mall and want to ask this question, does God love me? Everybody has an answer. Someone will say, yes, God love me. Someone will say, no, I don't think God love me. Another person will say, maybe sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. And when you go further to ask the people, why do you think God loves you? Someone may say, look at me, everything is going on for me very well. I have a job, my family is fine. A student may say, I finished all my exams and I passed everything. God loves me. Someone will say, I just got promoted a job. God loves me. Then you ask another person, why do you think God doesn't love you? And a person will be like, if you hear my story, you know that God doesn't love me at all. I've been struggling all my life. Nothing has been going on well for me. Someone will say, I just lost my job. If God loves me, why would I lose my job? Someone will say that I've been battling with this sickness and God has not healed me up to now. Why? If he loves me, why wouldn't he heal me? Okay, so people have different answers to this question. Someone will also say, maybe probably sometimes he loves me. If things are going on well for me, things are perfect, God loves me. But if things are not perfect, I don't think God loves me. We want to today find out if it is really true that God loves us or he doesn't. And we want to stay with the scriptures. You know, in James chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, James said, I do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, in whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. So James is saying that do not err. It means that do not be misled, my beloved brethren. So it means that you can be misled. And he says that every good and perfect gift is from above. Okay, and he says, come down from the Father of light, in whom is no variable. No variableness means... There, are no, there is no alteration in God. God is constant. And he called God the father of light. He said that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now when you read 1 John chapter, chapter 1 verse 5, it says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 is telling us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all, then we can say that God is cannot be both light and darkness at the same time. So the, the matter is either his light or his darkness. So it's either God loves us or he doesn't. He cannot actually be pretending sometimes to love us and sometimes he doesn't. Like James is saying, he's consistent. In him is no change. There is no variableness. Now let's go to Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Now, Luke 24, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This was after Jesus rose from the dead and he met. Let me give us a, ba a background of this text. Jesus just rose from the dead and he met two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they were having a conversation about the events of the last three days. So Jesus drew near to them and he said that, which conversation is this that you are having and you look so sad? And they told Jesus, are you new in town? Have you not heard of the prophet, the man that we thought is coming to redeem Israel? Three days ago, he's been crucified. And today, some of the women from our company went to the grave and his body is not there. So they were now telling Jesus about the events of the past three days, but they didn't know that the person who they are talking to was Jesus. So Jesus now answered them and said, Oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now, this is Jesus who just rose from the dead and he met these two disciples. Jesus could have just said unto them that I am Jesus, the one you are talking about. In fact, look at my hands. The nail prints are here. Or look at my side. But Jesus didn't do that. What did Jesus do? He sent them back to the scriptures. Beginning at Moses, it means that he started from Genesis. And he explained to them from the scriptures his death, burial, and resurrection. Instead of using the proof of himself. Why did he do that? Paul gave us a lead. So that our faith will not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It means that when it comes to explaining things pertaining our faith, the moment we want to stay with our experiences, there is a tendency of not having consistency with God. Like the question I asked about if we love God, consider if we want to define it based on our experiences, everybody will have different answers to the question, which may not be consistent with God. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he could have just used the normal proofs himself, telling them I'm the one, but no. He sent them to the scriptures, and he called them foolish for not reasoning or for not believing the scriptures like Moses and the other prophets have written. So it means that for us to explain any subject pertaining our faith, the best place to stay is to stay within the scriptures. So if you want to answer the question, does God love me? The place to stay to answer this question correctly should be from where? The scriptures. So Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 said unto Timothy, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in righteousness. So the word doctrine actually is the word for teaching in the Greek. It's didaskalia in the Greek. It means teaching. Now, Paul is telling Timothy that the basic way of teaching in the church is what? The scriptures. So it means that today we will put our experiences aside in answering the question, does God love me? And we stay with where? The scriptures to explain that. Amen. So we want to go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. Okay, first John chapter 4, verse 9. It says that in this the love of God was manifested towards us. That God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. So, John is saying that in this was manifested the love of God towards us. Now, the word he used manifested is the word used when something that is hidden is being revealed. So, John is saying that the love of God is revealed towards us in this. That he has sent his son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, it says that in this is love, not that we love God. So that in this is, is love. So it means that he first of all is telling us that what he's coming to say is how God's love is revealed towards us. 
And that love is revealed in God sending his son into the world that we might live through him. Then verse 10 says, in this is love. Not that we love God. So it means that if someone is thinking that the reason why God loved me is because I love God first, John is telling us that it's not because we love God. So God doesn't love us as a response to our love. So not that we love God. In fact, in the verse 19, it says that we love him because he first loved us. So the first person to express love is God. So it's not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So he gave his son. So it means that God giving his son to be the propitiation for our sins is the manifestation of God's love towards us. So that God's love is manifested towards me is in God giving his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Earlier in chapter 2, he said that he gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So it means that God loves us and God loves the world too. It means that that person that will wake up today and curse God, God loves that person. That person that will wake up today and say, there is no God, God loves that person. That's why God wants everyone to be saved. So it means that even the person that we may not like, God loves that person. You may not love somebody, but God likes that person. Because God's love is manifested in sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, John, John using manifest, it means that to anyone that the love of God probably may have been hidden, you are saying that, oh, if God loves me, why can I not see it? John is saying that what you cannot see actually is being revealed already. And that revelation is in the death of Jesus. Or Jesus being the propitiation for our sins is the love of God. And he said that the, the, one of the important things to pay attention to is that it is, it is not a response to our love. So someone that will say that God, God loves me based on what I do. God loves me if I'm doing the right thing and he doesn't love me if I'm not doing the right thing. It's actually not consistent. It doesn't mean we should go about doing everything that God wants us to do. But John is making it a point that God's love to us is not a response to what we did. But it is first of all an expression of his love. It's not, it's not because we did something to, to, to lure God to love us. He loved us without us doing anything. Now let's check Romans chapter 5. And see how Paul said the same thing. Romans chapter 5, verse 7. Say that for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. So God, uh, Paul actually started this argument from the point of the world. So he's saying that in the world, scarcely for a righteous man would someone want to die. I don't know anyone here who would want to die for another person. So Paul is starting the argument from the side. Even in the world, it is very scarce to get someone who would want to die for the righteous person. He said, perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. So it means that in the world, the righteous person and then the good man, they are even struggling to find someone to be the prophet, to, to, to replace them in the point of death. They will struggle. If in the world the righteous people and the good people are suffering, then it means that for the sinner, there is no hope. Because the righteous man and the good man are struggling to find a replacement. Then for the sinner, there is definitely no hope. You know, when we were in high school, uh, my high school in Ghana is, most of the things are controlled by seniors. So you can see senior offending and with the junior, and the senior will come and punish the junior for the two offenses, the same offenses committed by the two of them. The two of them can commit the same offense, they will get back to the hostel, and then the senior will punish the junior for the offense the two of them committed. Now, when teachers come in and sometimes the seniors are caught, teachers will now make a statement. They will be like, if the green grasses are burning, then we don't know for the dry ones. So the juniors are the dry ones. And if the seniors are being caught and being punished, it means that for the dry ones, there is, if you are caught, you are, in, you are in a mess. Like, there's no hope for you. 
Now, this is the same thing Paul is saying, saying that the good people, they don't have hope in the world because there's no one ready to pay for their sins. Then it means that for the sinner, there is no, I mean, there is no way that anyone will even come through for you. May probably they say that the pass mark for your class is 70%. And someone had 69, and he's begging the lecturer to add one. The lecturer said, no, you go there with your 40. You just turn your back and go home. But look at what he said in the next verse. In the verse 8. So that, but God commended his love towards us. In that world we are yet seen as Christ died for us. Now, Paul using bet means that whatsoever he said first, or whatsoever it's done among men, what God does contradicts what men do. Okay? So God's action towards us is not the same as what men do. Seeing that when God came to the scene, he didn't look for the righteous people or the good men. He demonstrated his love towards us. That while we were still sinners, note, he, he, he didn't demonstrate the love when we stopped sinning. Paul said that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we did not deserve it, when the people that seem to be righteous or good are struggling to get someone to die for them, in that time that we were dead in trespasses and sins, that was when God demonstrated his love towards us. Now, this word that Paul used, commended, which is actually also demonstrated. It, it is a word used when you want to prove something. You know, in mathematics, when uh, you can be given a question to prove an answer. The question you are given is to prove the answer, to find out if the answer is right or not. So it means that you can have the answer, but you will now be asked to prove your answer. The same word, this is the same word that Paul is using. He's saying that God proved his love towards us. Maybe you are thinking, if God loves me, he should prove it. Paul is saying that God proved his love towards us in this. That he sent Jesus to die for our sins while we were still sinners. It's not when we were doing the right thing. Look at what John said earlier. You know, John said that it's not that we love God. And Paul is now adding... It's not just about the fact that we, we don't love God. It's about the fact that we were even disobedient, disobeying God. We were in disobedience towards God. That was when God demonstrated his love. He demonstrated his love. He proved his love towards us in that time that we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Hallelujah. So it means that it has to reason that, look at the point that I was before God demonstrated his love towards me. It was where I was dead in trespasses and sin. His love was not demonstrated towards me when I was doing the right thing. So it's not, it's not now that something will now come and then he will now stop loving me. So the question to ask, the, the, question, the question we are asking, does God love me? If, if your answer is no, maybe probably because you are thinking things are not going well, or yours is maybe, or even your answer is yes because you think things are going well, it means that when things turn the other way, you will now be thinking God doesn't love you. But Paul is saying that it's not about how things are going around us. The major factor is that the worst states that we were is that we were dead in trespasses and sins. That was the worst states that we were. But at that time, God commended his love towards us. Praise God. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 8 and see how Paul and, and continue with the question that Paul asked. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35, Paul asks a question. He says that, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So, an open-ended question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Then he started mentioning things. He was now thinking for us. He wants to help us think. Maybe when he asks you this question, you may want to think, ah, maybe probably this thing can separate me from the love of Christ. But Paul started. He said, Um, shall tribulation or distress or persecution now these three are three different forms of sufferings tribulations is like uh, suffering from an external pain or someone infliging pain on you from an 
external source, okay, then distress is actually the word for narrowness. It's more of an emotional suffering when you are emotionally downcast. And you see that time that you are, that you are thinking that nobody loves you, everything is not going. You are just emotionally down, that kind of suffering emotionally. So Paul mentioned the external one, then he mentioned the emotional one. Then for the tribulation is a suffering for the gospel. Okay, when you are suffering for the gospel, people are being the persecution, when you are being persecuted for the gospel. So he used these three different kinds of suffering. And he's asking if these three sufferings can separate you from the love of God. Then he continued. He said, the next one I used was famine. Now, famine is like lack of food or hunger when there are no food. But in our world, we can say as a result of economic crisis, maybe probably you lost your job, so you cannot afford your bills. So Paul is asking, can this also separate you from the love of God? Maybe probably someone's question is, someone's answer is because I lost my job, so I don't think God loves me. Paul is asking that you lost your job. Can it separate you from the love of God? Can the fact that you failed that exam, can it separate you from the love of God? The fact that uh, you have bills to pay, can it separate you from the love of God? Then he continued. The next one is... Uh, Naked, nakedness is for uh, not having a covering. It's not just limited to not having clothing, but also not having shelter. Okay, the fact that, I mean, someone, someone will say, God loves me, I have food on my table, I have shelter. So someone will hear that and be like, oh, me, I don't have food, I don't have shelter. Does that mean God doesn't love me? And Paul is saying that the fact that you don't have a covering, does that also separate you from the love of God? So probably Paul is addressing everything that we may probably have been thinking about as something that separates us from the love of God. And he's, he's addressing them one by one, even though he's not in our world. He saw this coming. Amen. So he's addressing them one by one, asking these questions. Can this, is it a suffering? Is it a food? Is it lack of job? Can this separate you from the love of God? And the next one is distress. Distress is like danger. Uh, sorry, not the peril. Peril is like danger. Then sword. Sword is like war. Okay, people, I mean, there are war. I say, in terms of war, does that mean that these people, God doesn't love them? You know, sometimes we are quickly to judge and say that when, when we hear things happening around places, when we hear war and things, then we're like, ah, these people, God is punishing them. We are quick to judge. Paul is asking that, does this also separate the people from the love of God? Let's continue. Verse 36, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Pay attention to verse 37. Say that yet in all these things, what are the these things? The things that we mentioned earlier, in the sufferings, the, 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 the inner suffering, the outside suffering, the suffering for the gospel, when, when you have no food, when you lost your joy, that in all these things, in all these things, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. Now, he's saying that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So, it actually means that the, the wrong question is to say, or the wrong thing is to say, because this is happening, God doesn't love me. The right one actually is to say, even though this is happening, because God loves me, I am more than a conqueror. So, probably I just lost my job. And I'm thinking about it. Paul is saying that there is not, then you don't want to ask God, is it because God doesn't love me, that's why I lost my job? No, that's the wrong way to say it. The right way to say is that even though I lost my job, because God loves me, I'm applying again. And this time around, I'm more than a conqueror. Maybe you are struggling to pass an exam as a student. And you are thinking, all my colleagues have passed why am I struggling? If God loves me, why am I not passing this paper? Paul is saying that it's not about the fact that you are passing or you are failing. The matter actually is that because God loves you, you will go again. And this time, you are more than a conqueror. So the, the wrong way is to say, God doesn't love me because this is not going on well. I'm struggling with this. I don't think God loves me. If really God loves me, why am I struggling with this? Why, why are things not going well? Why am I the only person suffering in Poland? Why is it that when they call me from home every day, it's problems? Why is it that every day things are not going well? Paul is saying that that's the wrong way to say it. The right one is, uh, the right way is actually say, because God loves me so much, 
Come what may, I am more than a conqueror. I don't know what lies ahead of me, but I know that I'm going again because I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. And he didn't love me because I did something right. He didn't love me when I was doing the right thing. He loved me when, I'm, when I was dead in trespasses and sins. So it means that no matter what lies ahead of me, in many more years to come, maybe you want to live to 500 years, in many more years to come, no matter what lies ahead, God loved me so I am more than what? A conqueror. Praise God. Now let's, con and, and he said that in, he said that for I am persuaded that neither death nor life. So Paul is saying that neither death nor life. It means that death cannot separate someone from the love of God. <laughs> it means that life cannot separate someone from the love of God. So neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can you think about? No matter what you can think about, is probably in the future. The worst thing that you can think about is probably in the future, which you think can separate you from the love of God. What can that worst thing be? Paul is saying that neither life nor death. These are things present or things to come. What do you think is coming for you? That you are worried about, that you are thinking about, that you cannot sleep at night. What do you think is the matter that's making you think that this one, you probably even want to give up? Paul is saying that that thing can never separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come what may, no matter what lies ahead, so that they can never separate you from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the question again, does God love me? Is it based on the fact that I'm doing the right thing? Is it based on the fact that things are going well or things are not going well? Paul is saying that no matter what you are thinking, even, even at the time that you don't even love him, he loves you before that. Praise God. Someone may say that, me, if God loves me, why am I not feeling it? I mean, if someone loves you, you should feel it down. Why am I not feeling it? Amen. So I, should, I want to feel the love of God. God loves me. I should feel it. Let's, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. John says that, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. He says that we have known and believed. He didn't say that we have filled the love of God. You know, feelings are subject to change. It's like weather conditions. Some days ago, we were walking about with any shirt that you want to wear. But today, or maybe some two months, November and December, we all be wearing like three, four shirts at a go. It means that our feelings can be subject to change at any time. So, so that you are feeling good or you are not feeling good, does not mean God loves you or he doesn't love you. Paul is saying that, we, uh, John is saying that we have known and believed. So it's about knowing and believing the love of God for you. You know, when you close from church and you enter your room. When you want to put on the light in your living room, you are not feeling whether it will turn on or it will not. You just know that when you press that in light will come. That's a no way. No matter what is happening, whether it's raining, it's not raining. Maybe in Africa when it's raining, you know that when you turn it will not come. <laughs> but here, you know that whatever is happening, when you press it, light will come. That's what Paul is saying that you have known you have come to, so he's saying that you come to know and believe it. So the first thing is to come to know and believe the love of God towards us. Now, when you now come to the knowing and the believing of the love of God towards you, no matter what is happening, you not question that love of God, but you rather stand on the love of God to be able to fight that other one. 
so that the question is not about God loving you or not because his loving us is constant. It will not change today. It will not change tomorrow. But the other things which are subject to change, the only way we can stand and fight them is when we stand on this one which doesn't change the love of God. So Paul is saying that, John is saying that we come to know and believe the love of God for us. So stop using feelings to determine it. Why do I want to use feeling? You can always say that God doesn't love you. When it comes to the knowing and the believing of it, you always hold on to it that God loves you. Come what me. Amen. Ephesians 3 verse 19 and we are almost closing. Ephesians 3, 19. To know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is also saying that, that we come to what? Know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It's not like saying that it's not that the love of Christ passes knowledge, but it's actually in the Greek, it means to know the surpassing knowledge of the love of Christ. That's what Paul is telling us to do, that we come to know it. We put the feelings aside. So that things are going well, or things are not going well, or you have a lot of things that are bad these days around you, and you are, you are thinking of a way out, and you want to say that these things are happening because God doesn't love me. Your question, like we said, is the wrong one. The right one to actually say is that because God loves me, I'm fighting this one and I'll overcome because I am more than a conqueror. You know, the word for the more than a conqueror actually means that you cannot be defeated. It's actually a word that says that you cannot, you cannot be defeated in that matter. So it means that as you go again, you are more than a conqueror. It means that you overcome that one. Is it, is it the exam you are struggling to pass? As you go again, you overcome that one. Is it the job? As you go again, you overcome that one. Because come what may, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. So, so, so as we close, more often we want to explain God's love based on the love of this world, you know. Sometimes we want to uh, use how things go on this world, how love is explained in this world. You know, when I was in the university, I read a, a certain book, Five Love Languages, that talk about how love is expressed among men. So sometimes we want to use how love is expressed among men to explain the love of God. And in doing that, more often we, we end up getting it wrong because God has his own standards of love. He has his own standard. You know, in, in, in Romans, Paul says that they going about to establish their own righteousness could not attain to the standard of God's righteousness. So God has his standards in everything. Even in God's love, there is a standard. And we should not just go use the love of the world to to explain this one, no, we will get this wrong because the first person to express love is God. The first person to express love towards us is God. The moment you want to compare it with the love of the world, we will get it wrong. He has his standard of love. And what is that love? It is in the Father when we were dead in sins and trespasses, Christ died for us. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter what lies ahead of us, nothing, not today, not 10 years to come, can separate us from the love of God. No matter what you are thinking that, ah, this boy, you are a small boy now. You don't know. Yeah, I'm a small boy, though. You don't know what is happening around me, and you are telling me this. I'm not the one saying it. Paul said, you know, Paul saying this. Paul suffered than most of the apostles, and Paul saying this, in all his sufferings, saying this, I don't know what you are suffering actually, but this actually should be a proof to you that no matter what lies ahead, come what may, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. Amen. Thank you for that word, Hope. I'm going to ask you to stay up here in the front with me. And uh, we're going to have a time of uh, invitation. This is a time if God is working on your heart right now, and uh, I would